Mm-hmm. So I moved from Ohio, closed my psych- psychologist um, practice, and moved to Hawaii to host fasting retreats. That's so rough. <laughs> it, it was horrible. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the reshape your health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and I am so excited for today's interview. We have Dr. Terry Lance with us today, and she actually began her career as a middle school teacher. Then she went and got a PhD in counseling psychology, and she was in private practice for about 13 years. And then she went to work for the fasting method. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a program developed by Dr. Jason Fung. You know, I'm a huge fan of his work and Megan Ramos, which helps people adopt an intermittent fasting lifestyle uh, with the general goal of weight loss and reversal of type two diabetes. So in her role there, she coaches clients in behavior change strategies, and she's also the co-host of the Monday mindset podcast. So she gave me permission to call her Terry during this interview. And the focus is really going to be on this behavioral psychology, the mindset piece. We might get a little woo woo, which both of us are all about. Um, and it's really important. You know, I was telling her before we started recording, you don't get far into a weight loss coaching career without addressing this stuff because you can tell someone what to eat, but if they don't change the thoughts that's driving the eating behavior, you just don't get very far. So Terry, welcome to the show. Can you just start by sharing your amazing story for those of you, for people listening that don't know? Sure. Thank Thank you first for having me here. It's very exciting. So I grew up, I know my story starts young as for many Mm -hmm. people. I grew up overweight. Um, I think by the age of like starting kindergarten, I was getting significantly overweight. So I I struggled with it all the way through school, through high school, into college. I did a number of weight loss strategies during high school. I joined a weight loss program and because I was under 18, they had to limit how much they could restrict my calories, but I think I was still restricted to a thousand calories a day. And it was, you know, low fat, um, nothing that I would normally eat, but I worked really hard and I lost a significant amount of weight, but of course returned to old patterns and gained it all back and more went to college, started my career as, as you said, a middle school teacher, um, brutal, brutal job, but um, <laughs> learned, learned a lot of great things and continued to struggle with my weight. And then I left that to go back to grad school full-time for my PhD. And, and, and during that time, I continued to not do well weight-wise. And I would lose weight, gain weight, lose 50 pounds, gain 60 pounds, as many of us have experienced. And it wasn't until... Um, I'm sorry, blanking on something here. Okay, toward the end of my graduate program, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. And it was not surprising to me because both of my grandmothers had type two diabetes. And I just remembered hearing as a kid, it skips a generation. And so I I did the math and I, I knew what that meant. It meant I was going to have diabetes. And so I was in my early thirties, diabetic, and, you know, they just started putting medications in, adding more and more medications as we went. And I wasn't getting any better. Things actually just kept getting worse. I gained more weight, some medication, one medication I took three weeks in, I had gained nine pounds. So really a devastating approach for me, but I was also naive and stubborn. And so I was very un- willing to do any actual changes on my own. Mm. So I didn't change my eating. I didn't change my lifestyle. And it wasn't until I was in my mid forties that I I finally changed that. And at this time I was in private practice as a therapist and I started my, I would say my health journey really with the whole 30 approach. Mm -hmm. And it was a shocking change for me because I was eating pop tarts for breakfast and bread all day and diet soda all day. And then I started this whole food, three meals a day, you know, no grains, no sugar, no dairy. It, it kind of cut out everything I was used to eating, but I felt so much better. And my primary goal when I started it was to lose weight. And I joined 
a couple of online groups connected to it. And everyone in there was losing a lot of weight in the first 30 days. Um, and if, if anyone's familiar with it, um, they have you not weigh yourself for 30 days. So I was so excited. I was coming back on day 30 and I knew I was going to lose like 18, 20 pounds. I was, I was doing so well. And it got to day 30 and I had lost four pounds. And I was a bit devastated by that. Not that four pounds is not good in a month, but I had made such drastic changes that I really expected bigger results. But what I also found is in that time, I had to come off of one of my diabetic medications. I had decided to continue my whole 30 for 100 days because I knew 30 days was not going to be enough to change what I was doing. So I went for 100 days. By the time I got to 100 days, I had lost 22 pounds. I had come off all three of my diabetic medications and I was doing so much better and feeling so much better. So I knew then that there was something to this, eating real food, figuring out what foods are problematic for your body. And I, I stayed in the kind of the paleo approach for a while after that. And eventually I transitioned to a more ketogenic style because of my blood sugar had started to go up again. So around this time, I realized that I wasn't completely happy in my career. I loved helping people and I loved them risking talking with me about difficult things. I loved all of that, but I felt kind of limited in how I could help because I was watching people working with depression and anxiety and other concerns while eating a diet that I knew was interfering for them. And when I would touch on it, they would be very resistant. They saw no connection. And so I just felt like I could help less and less with my new information, new knowledge I had. I wanted to help people differently. And around this time, I had started moderating a Facebook group for the Two Keto Dudes. And through that process, I met Megan Ramos at the Fasting Method. It was called the Intensive Dietary Management Program at the time. And she had said, well, you know, I might be interested in working with you. I said, great. And I didn't know what she meant. I thought maybe we'd work on something together. Well, she actually meant me coming and working with them. And so soon after that, I transitioned to becoming a coach with the fasting method. In the beginning of my job, we were actually starting a fasting retreat program. Mm -hmm. So I moved from Ohio, closed my psych psychologist um, practice and moved to Hawaii to host fasting retreats. That's so rough. <laughs> it, it was horrible. <laughs> um, so we hosted two, I hosted two fasting retreats um, on the big island and was working as a coach at that time. And then just prior to the pandemic beginning, I moved back to the mainland. So I, I now live in California um, and we have not done any retreats since then, but we're looking at that again for our future. Um, but this transition for me has been about bringing in my background as an educator and a therapist and working with people on these more specific goals about their optimizing their health, reversing health conditions and losing weight. And to me, the biggest part is I don't want them just to lose weight or just get good blood sugar. I want them to transform as people. And that's the exciting part of this work in my eyes. That's amazing. It's amazing. And I want to shift the conversation a little bit. We had touched offline about this whole paradigm of, you know, really acting for your future self. Mm -hmm. And I heard a line, I don't know, on some podcast, I listened to a lot of stuff and it was like, are you setting your future self up for success? Is current you setting future self up for success? Are you teeing yourself up or are you setting yourself up for sabotage? Are your current choices helping future you? And honest to goodness, that thought is the only thing that I needed to keep my house clean all week, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, and my car clean all week, because I'm like, I'm only hurting myself. The negative choices that I make today I'm only hurting myself tomorrow. Why would I want to hurt myself? So from your experience, why do people stay stuck 
which we know is just an illusion of being stuck because our thoughts are always moving. Energy is always flowing. We're just stuck in the same negative neural loops. Why do people stay stuck in those same automatic negative thoughts that lead to Mm self-sabotage? That's, that's an amazing question. And I'm thinking about six books and eight podcasts that all play into this, but all the, all the resources you want, we can dump them. This will be a resource dump. Yeah. I think the big part of it is, is at some level, just limiting beliefs that we've learned. And I think especially, and I know you aren't talking only in this area, but especially around weight loss, most people that come to our community or come to me as a coach, they're not new at this. They've had a lifetime of struggle with it and they've tried 50 and 60 times and they feel that they have failed 50 and 60 times. And so I think, unfortunately, those limiting beliefs keep getting reinforced. And so what you're really talking about is seeing the the possibility of change and growth and things being different. And I think oftentimes our experience tells us that's a foolish thought because you know what's going to happen. You know you're coming right back here. And so I think oftentimes we feel very limited to see, and, and, you know, we're learning more about neuroplasticity and things, but I think most of us are still a little reluctant to believe it's possible for us. That might be something other people get to experience, but I'm stuck in these patterns. And also when it comes to health and weight, I think a lot of us still at some level attribute it to, I've kind of inherited this just like I did. I thought Mm -hmm. I inherited type two from my grandmothers. There's nothing I could do about it. Well, certainly I've learned differently, but So if we've seen our parents struggle with health problems or weight concerns, we feel doomed to just play that out. And so I think oftentimes we just feel limited. I I talk to so many people who kind of see it as this is who I am. This is how I am. It's not a choice. And I feel like I have to keep pushing that lever to help them see that they can change it. They can shift those thought patterns and your brain will shift with you. It will revert back quickly if you allow it to, but it it will shift. And the thing that I loved about what you brought up is the whole idea of future self. And I feel like this is a concept I've kind of had in my mind for a while, but had never really been able to articulate it until a couple of authors and podcasts. Um, Joe Dispenza, who I love, talks about this a lot. He does meditations even from, you know, picturing your life in your future self, creating the life you're leading as your future self, rather than being stuck in the patterns of our past selves. And another one that when you started talking about it really reminded me of Benjamin Hardy. And he talks about making decisions from our current self. We are very driven by the dopamine in the here and now. So if I eat this thing right now, I'm going to feel good in this moment. I'm probably not going to feel good in five minutes or two hours or five days or 10 years. And so that idea that you brought up, I think is so important to check in with ourselves. Is this decision going to make me feel okay right now and come at a cost to my future self? And we have to tilt that scale so that we are investing more in our future self than going for the immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. I think that is so true. And I haven't heard of those two resources, so I'm glad that you mentioned them. And I think that reminds me of the growth versus the fixed mindset, Mm -hmm. right? So someone with a fixed mindset thinks there's no hope for me. This is how it's always going to be. I'll try again because I feel like I should, but I don't really believe anything's ever going to change because I've already tried everything and nothing works for me. And it runs in my family and I don't have the discipline and I don't have the time and excuse after excuse after excuse, justifying a fear of failure, justifying a fear of criticism, you know, and it, and it's like, we want to hold on to those so much because we created them. You know, those are, those are our little excuse children. And we feel like we have to defend our excuses. And I really believe that life will, if life is trying to teach you a lesson, i.e. you can change, you can feel better. You're designed to feel better, you know, God or source energy or creator. 
wants you to feel better. That energy is within you to feel better. And I just, I really believe that people get so that they get so stuck and they think that it's not possible for me, but if life is trying to teach you a lesson, it might start with a little pebble, you know, it might start with a five pound weight gain, a 10 pound weight gain. And if you don't pay attention, if you don't listen, it's going to give you a rock it might give you a, a diagnosis of type two diabetes mm -hmm. might give you some medications. And then if you still don't learn, you're going to get a boulder, you're going to get neuropathy, you're going to get an amputation. You're going to get a wound a life-changing event that I saw over and over and over again in geriatric physical therapy. And so I think both of us are very committed to helping people understand you can change, pay attention to the pebble, pay attention to the rock before it becomes a boulder. And so I think that people listening maybe can start to identify, oh yeah, like I have limiting thoughts. Yep. I have those. So what do we do about them? How do you help your clients go from that fixed mindset to the growth mindset mm -hmm. from the limiting thoughts to the limitless thoughts? So many thoughts while you were talking like, oh man, so many <laughs> things we could dive deeper on. I think one of the things going back to the growth mindset with Carol Dweck's work is to look at one of the components of it is if you have a growth mindset you see other people's success as an indicator of what's possible. And I think a lot of us look at other people's success and may feel a little challenged by it. Like, why did they get gifted that talent or skill or opportunity and I didn't? And I hear that even in our community because we have a Facebook group. It's a, you know, 100,000 or more people Facebook group. And people write their success stories there. And some people are very inspired by them. But other people are almost discouraged by them because they feel like, well, that person did it, but I can't. And so I think the important thing of the growth mindset here is to recognize when I see someone else has achieved this, I should be curious. What did they do? How did that work for them? What pieces of that could work for me? my journey may not look exactly like theirs. Their exact strategies may not become my exact strategies, but they are proof there is the possibility. How can I incorporate that? But if I have a fixed mindset, I believe there's no growth for me in this. I've maxed out on my ability to, to handle this. And then going back to something else you said about the pebble, the rock, the, the boulder, I think, unfortunately, a lot of us have learned to interpret those things as signs that we can't have more, be more, do more. And I think when it comes to health and weight, I hear a lot of people talk about it almost feeling like it's their body sabotaging them, their body working against them. They're the victim. Yes. To their own Versus body. Versus your body wants to work with you and it is struggling. How can you remove barriers? How can you help it? Because mm -hmm. it will work well for you. Right now it can't. But if you take that on in a defeated way as my body won't work for me, it's going to be really hard to make any changes. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out one thing when you were talking about kind of signs of that fixed mindset. I heard again on the podcast, uh, a definition of jealousy that I really liked. And it's that you're seeing something in someone else that's undeveloped in yourself. So a characteristic in someone else or an achievement in someone else, or a sense of confidence or weight loss in someone else that you desire that's undeveloped in yourself. And I think instead of sitting in that anger and that judgment of that jealousy can cause, which would be in a fixed mindset, if we can just shift that to, you know what, good for them. I see that I want that too. <laughs> and I see it's not developed yet. And I'm looking forward to that developing, you know, you just kind of shift from that fixed mindset thought into a growth mindset thought. And I think this would be a really cool time to kind of dive into the woo woo side of things. Um, and when we say, when I say woo woo, I mean, energy flow, I mean, what is your emotional state? And how do, how does your emotional state 
drive your physical state because usually again, when people come to me, when they come to you, they've tried a lot of things. They've tried a lot of diets. They've tried a lot of programs and very few actually dig deep into mindset, um, which is what is driving that behavior, you know? So they might fix the symptom of weight loss, but, but excess weight is a symptom of something deeper. So first of all, what does woo woo mean to you? That's kind of what it means to me is energy flow and emotional health and how all of that ties together to create our uh, thoughts and drive our actions. I would agree with that definition. I think, you know, I'm smiling even as you say it, because I think I use the term woo woo to indicate, I think other people may not be open to it. And so I, I, yeah. I put it out there lightly in case they're open to it because it's something that goes against how many of us are taught to believe things in the here and now, very concrete, physical way of explaining things. And that idea of energy, you and I you know, briefly said this before we came on here, but the idea of the law of attraction, for many people, it just feels so out there and so contrary to a, a belief system. But I think even for people who have grown up within a faith-based belief system, it parallels that quite a bit, that there's, there's a, a source, there's a, um, an energy that pulls things together, that wants good things for you, that will help show you what you need, guide you to what you need to be experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something that all of us could benefit from being open to, regardless of what our own belief system is, is our role in it. Amen. <laughs> that it's not just crazy? something, not just something that happens to us, but I really believe in we create so much of our experience. And I don't just mean this on the level of thinking positively, but making yeah. sense of our world from an empowered place. What am I learning? What am I seeking? How can I do this in a way that supports me rather than, uh-oh, I just have to kind of dodge these things coming at me mm -hmm. or white knuckle my way through this, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so you said guided and I heard a line recently that I loved a question and it said, how would you live your life? If you knew you were being guided, mm -hmm. what would you release? Would you release feeling like you need to control everything? Mm -hmm. Would you, would you release the worry that you have around something? Would you release the fear of failure because you knew you were being guided? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really comforting thought. And another thing that I heard of recently is I can't remember what the counsel you may, you may know what the counseling strategy is called or the system is called, but it's essentially that we have a little child in us. I have a little Morgan, you have a little Terry and that we have wounds from our childhood, you know? And those haven't necessarily been healed. And then we carry that emotional baggage, baggage into adulthood and unknowingly that the automatic negative thoughts from those experiences are driving our actions today. And we almost have to kind of develop that inner parent and parent herself, kind of like reparent herself and tell that little child within us what it needs to hear. You're safe, mm -hmm. you're secure, you're loved just the way you are. You're perfect just the way you are. Um, have you heard of that model? Have you used that in your mm -hmm. um, professional career? I think you're touching on the family systems approach. Yes. Where it's really, it's kind of the dynamics in a family, but they're within ourselves. Is, and... is it the inner family systems or the, in, isn't it like the inner family systems approach? I don't know, something like that. I'm trying to remember the, act. I, it's funny. You're actually catching on, on I am someone who goes for the feel of things and <laughs> often forget the science technicalities of it, where I have colleagues that can tell you the name of every theory, every part, who came up with the theory. I think there is a family systems approach. That's um, similar. I just wanted us to kind of nail that down in case someone wanted to like, look it up further, yep. but it's close enough. If you're interested yes. in it, you could start there. So yes. What do you, how have you used that in your practice specifically, uh, surrounding weight loss and food and, you know, maybe some struggles with body image or confidence. Mm -hmm. 
I think lots of ways. So one that you just touched on is the idea of um, being enough, regardless of your weight, your size, your academic ability, being lovable. And so many of us have learned to earn love, that we earn it through what we do. We earn it through how pretty we are, how smart we are, how accomplished we are. And that almost always leads us into problematic behaviors. Um, so that one I think is really important. I think um, of like, you know, especially a mother and a daughter's relationship or negative messaging that they got of like, your life would be better if you looked like so-and-so or a lot of comparison growing up, like mm -hmm. maybe not direct messaging like that, but I can think of a client's mom who was always looking to other people who were thin and saying, Oh, isn't she pretty? Look how thin she is. And then mm -hmm. if someone was heavier, they'd be like, Oh, that, that girl's a little heavy. And so the message that my client got was being thin is good. Being heavy is bad. I get good attention when I'm thin, I'm going to do everything I can to be thin. And it kind of got her on that, like really restrictive diet mm -hmm. mentality, because that's what got her positive attention from her mom. And so kind of going back to what did you need to hear? You didn't need mm -hmm. that negative of messaging. So what did you need to hear? It was, you are enough. You're beautiful. You're deeply valued and appreciated just as, the, you know, just as you are. Absolutely. So that was kind of like a concrete example, but you know, as a parent, so I have a boy who's almost four, he'll be four when this is aired and a girl who's two. And I'm really intentional as I'm coaching my clients, like, well, what did you need to hear to tell that to my kids now? And it's like, I don't think that I would tell them that otherwise. It doesn't always feel very natural. If I'm being honest to say, you are so loved just the way you are. You are perfect just the way you are. I love you no matter what because we want to control things. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's almost like we use our love to control. Right. And that's and not to how teach. we're, and to teach. And we're not, that's mm -hmm. not, that's not how we're supposed to love. You know, we are unconditionally loved by God or source or spirit. And we are designed to live our fullest life when we allow that love to flow through us unconditionally to others. Mm -hmm. So what's up with that? Give me a little counseling on like, why, why am I so inclined to, um, want to manipulate a situation by withholding or giving my love? I think if you kind of go back to what's your role as parent, you part of your role as parent is to help teach them and guide them into how to develop. And so you attach your expression of acceptance or love to doing certain things, behaving mm -hmm. certain ways. What if you just said, man, I love you so much right now. And it didn't, it wasn't connected to what they Anything. were doing, what yes. they had done, how they look. But also we tend to replicate what we know. Mm -hmm. And so we were taught that we were taught that through our families. We were taught that through school. When do you get yeah. positive attention at school? Good grade, pretty good dress, when you got to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we reenact that. And so you are really trying to break that pattern and give that unconditional positive regard, that love and acceptance, not because it is earned, but because it just is there. And same goes for my husband too. I mean, you can really see patterns, you know, generational patterns of how spouses have interacted with each other. And, you know, I had a really, really great deep counseling session through our church. It was a three hour spiritual session about, um, resentment and anger, you know, and like, I don't look like a person that holds anger or resentment, but sometimes I do. And sure. what's the source of that and how can we release that? And, um, it was a beautiful thing. And so, if, you know, I think that if people, feel like they have something that they're stuck in, you know, an emotional pattern that they're stuck in, especially if it's affecting their health or their relationships, seeking some professional counseling can be so beneficial. Absolutely. So what are some of your favorite strategies? Let's start with finding limiting thoughts. 
-hmm. How do you find those thoughts that are holding people back? Because one of my clients went through some program and she said this line, she's like, if, if you can name it, you can tame it. And if you can name that limiting thought, you can tame it. So let's start first with the naming mm-hmm. and talk about some strategies of like, well, you know, I think a lot of things in a, in a day, how do I know which ones are complete BS and how do I know which ones are actually mm-hmm. true for me? I think an important part with that is pay attention to your response when you think it. What's happening in your body? Yeah. Are you tense when you think it or say it? Are you relaxed? Do you feel like you're pushing it away? Do you feel like you're open and expansive when you're hearing it or saying it? Pay attention to what's even going on in you at that time. And then I often encourage people if they start to recognize it, and maybe it means um, I look at a behavior toward my health or my eating patterns, and I just start to do some journaling that says, I'm struggling to do this because, and just write down anything that you feel Mm -hmm. like is getting in the way. When I think about doing this, I think, I think it's not possible for me. I think it won't work. I think other people can do this, but I can't. I think I've passed the point of no return on this. So you can just start to hear those limiting beliefs. And then start to, again, check in. How do I feel when I hear that? And I even encourage, does that message come from somewhere outside of you? Yes. Yeah. Because oftentimes people can say, oh yeah, that's my dad's voice. Yeah. I learned that from my fourth grade teacher. Mm -hmm. So then again, looking at, okay, so you're carrying this message with you now when you're 50 or 42 or whatever that your fourth grade teacher said, do you want to change that message at all? Um, I used to have clients do this when I was a therapist. I would have them identify all of these statements about themselves and start getting rid of the ones that they could get rid of. And sometimes they would put them on a note card or slips of paper, and then they would tear off that one. They would say it and they would crumple it up and throw it away. And I had one client come back one time and she was living in the residence halls because I worked in a college and she came back and she says, well, I got rid of my notes. I stripped them off and I I burned them. I said, you burned them. I was a little nervous that the residence hall was going to burn down. But the idea of releasing those messages because they're no longer necessary, they're no longer true or potentially were never true. They were someone's opinion. They were someone's way of navigating and teaching you, but letting go of them. And oftentimes they will come back with four or five that they haven't let go of yet. They're really struggling with those. Mm -hmm. So we have to dig a little deeper. What would help you to believe a different truth than this? And I was thinking of this a little bit in something you said earlier about like the relationship, the dynamic with a mother daughter, if you were getting certain messages about how you looked or weight or something like that. Sometimes I think we often reject that after a while and we stop working to seek the positive because we feel it's unattainable. Hmm. And so if I'm never going to be thin enough, right? why would I bother doing this? Yeah. It kind of almost creates apathy. Yeah, absolutely. And pushes us in the opposite direction. So I think going back to the, just the idea of these limiting beliefs, identifying what they are seeing if you can identify the source. Now, sometimes I even think in identifying the source, try to understand, can you put that into context? Will you explain that a little bit? Sure. Let's say, for example, um, you have a limiting belief about, I should never waste food. Mm -hmm. If I waste food, I'm being bad. And so if I've made that food, I should eat all of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where does that come from? How did you learn that? When did you learn that? Oh, when I was seven, my family had no money and everything my mom bought, we had to eat. You did not waste food. Okay. Well, that's really important because you're in a different place now at age, you know, 40 or whatever. And are you being disrespectful to throw away that food? So really digging in, where did you hear the message? What was the given context at that time? 
because it, it may not have been a negative message, a shaming message or a, a harsh message. It may have been a coping message of we can't afford to throw away food. Please eat mm-hmm. everything I give you. Mm-hmm. But now when I'm 40, I don't have to keep eating every single thing that I put on my plate yeah. or that I bring into my kitchen. And I can release that guilt associated with throwing the food away. And that's what I just wrote down. Like, you know, the four step pro, I don't know, whatever four step process to find your limiting thoughts. What are they doing some journal prompts? Um, who's the source? What's the context? And then like, what's the new message? You know, I also um, think there's yeah, a piece in there for some of us. What would it mean to let this go? Okay. Tell me more about that. There's probably some good examples from that. It sounds a little weird to say like, of course, we'd want to get rid of any negative message that's Mm -hmm. holding us back. But if it's something that we've been holding onto and basing decisions on for many years, it could feel a little bit threatening to let that thought go. It might feel a little disrespectful. That was a thought I got from my mom. Yeah. She's no longer here. I'm going to disrespect her if I throw that thought out. Mm Mm-hmm versus how can I honor it? She gave me that for her own needs. And I'm at a place now where it's safe to let it go and to create a new one. Mm -hmm. And I think that you hit on something there. And I think sometimes that's why they're so sneaky. So some of my personal limiting thoughts, just in general, were actually kind of handed down behaviors from my mom, who's the most amazing person ever. And so I think it's really hard. It was hard for me to recognize that because I think of her so highly, you know, she's almost on a pedestal. Nothing she could do is wrong. Like she's perfect. No one's perfect, you know? And so really kind of allowing that to happen, allowing that process to happen, um, honoring her exactly what you said, because she had a completely different context than I have. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a really helpful kind of second line of questioning. Well, what would it mean to let that go? What's the context mm-hmm. there? Did it have purpose and meaning back then when you were a child? Mm-hmm. Can we let that go? And one thing that I wrote down too is when you're writing down those thoughts, like on a piece of paper, and then you crumple it up and you throw it away. I think it depersonifies the, the thought. And I've heard of that a lot too, of giving that inner voice of negativity that, you know, is not your source. It's not you. It's, it's just not that positive radiating light within you giving it a name to, um, objectify that voice and, and remove your own identity from that. So removing those negative thoughts is a part of who you are. I'm just like, those are in my brain, but that's not me. That's not who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that kind of writing things down, throwing them away, having that visual experience, that visceral experience of this is not me anymore. Mm -hmm. And then it makes it more clear if that thought pops back into your brain and it likely will. Nope. That's not me. I threw that one away. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you ever recommend that? I've never recommended someone name their inner voice. Um, but I've heard of a lot of people doing that. Have you done that or recommended that? The way that I have done it, and this is maybe sharing a little TMI, but oh, um, never, not on here. <laughs> I I sought out a new therapist when I moved here, and she wrote a book called the Self Sabotage Behavior Workbook. Well, that's great. I need that, so I I sought her out as a therapist, and so a lot of our work has been about self sabotage, and she does have you name that saboteur. Yeah. So that you recognize there's a part of your brain that may be holding on to things that get in your way and it's not you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if your saboteur's name is Lucinda, you know, yours, (laughs) no, (laughs) mine is Bob, but, um, you know, it, it, it does, it helps you separate it out. This isn't me. It's a part of my brain, you know, enacting in this way that is actually holding me back. And I can recognize, I can recognize Bob's tricks. Mm. I know why he's doing what he's doing and I don't have to, to, to believe it or fall into it. The other thing that you said about um, naming it, another um, approach is to even identify what it is. I'm having a thought that. Ah, I like that. So again, it's creating a little distance. This isn't me. I'm having a thought that 
I like that a lot. And that's so simple. Uh huh. That's so simple. One of my other podcast guests was like, you can swipe on your thoughts, just like you swipe on Tinder, you know, mm-hmm. it pops up in your brain. You, I've never used Tinder cause I don't mm-hmm. have to, but you swipe in Oh, yeah. that thought popped in. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. I'm having a thought that not yeah. I am. Mm-hmm. So I'm having a thought that I'm feeling not, I am feeling that's yep. a really important distinction because we tend to own our feelings and hold them very mm. close versus no. Oh, this is a thought that's passing through. I'm, you know, I'm having a thought that I'm, and then another way to distance it even a little more, I'm aware that I'm having a thought that. So again, getting it a little less close to us. Yes. I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. I'm aware that I'm having a thought that Mm -hmm. I like that. And it's changing that internal dialogue. And it really requires us to be present to our thoughts. Mm-hmm. you know, and when we're on autopilot much of the day, that can be hard. So what are some tips that you give people to be more present to their own internal dialogue? I say one, try to listen as much as you can, even if you have to catch it after the fact, mm-hmm. you'll, you may hear it. Ooh, that kind of hurt when I said that, or I cringed when I said that replay it in your mind, replay it in your journal. When my boss said this to me, Here's how I would like to respond. Give yourself the prompts to even practice a different way to respond because right now you're still responding in your old patterns. So start to give yourself some room to practice a new response. Identify it when you can, create some new ones, do some journaling, reframe it. If you're with someone who feels safe, reframe it with them. Mm -hmm. Say it and then say, you know, I want to try that again. Say it again. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to go back to something else you said. I'm, I'm trying to put this back into place, but um, when we have limiting beliefs, especially based on things that we haven't feel like we don't feel like we've achieved yet or done well enough with, I've listened recently to Carol Dweck's talks, and she's the author of Growth Mindset. But one of the concepts that I love that she uses is the word yet the power of yet. So let's say, for example, I'm talking about my weight loss and my fixed mindset is now I can't lose weight. I've never been successful losing weight. Well, if we focus on the power of yet instead of what's already happened, I've not been successful at losing and maintaining weight loss yet. Mm -hmm. So there's this opening for possibility versus just shutting the door. It's not possible. So Mm -hmm. again, a favorite thing I just pulled from one of her talks recently is this idea of the power of yet. If you say, I'm working on no snacking and I'm really struggling with it. To be able to say, I'm working to develop my no snacking skills and I haven't mastered them yet. Mm -hmm. rather than, and I'm failing miserably. (laughs) Soften the language. Who is it? Marissa Peer and I am enough. Have you read that one? That's a really good one. And she says, we really need to use softer language with ourself. Um, Mm -hmm. One of my clients recently said, I'm terrified to go down to the kitchen at night because I'm afraid I'm going to binge. And I said, that's, those are the literal, the literal instructions that you're giving your brain is to be terrified of the kitchen and that you will binge. Mm -hmm. And like, terrified is like a bus is going to hit you terrified is like something big, you know, but that's pretty dramatic language to use. And I know that it f- might feel that way, mm-hmm. but using that harsh, severe language can augment those negative emotions in a way that's not promoting the healthy relationship with food in the kitchen that she wants. And Absolutely. I think that, have you studied the law of attraction? I'm guessing that you have. You know, well, isn't I will that say so that cool? I went to an Abraham Hicks talk when you did came to San Diego. Absolutely. What did you think? Cause I kind of wish I was there right beside you. I feel like we're a little bit of, you know, soul sisters and all this. Yeah. It was amazing. And it really is like, I listen to them all the time, uh-huh. but being in an audience in the moment, you feel the energy, you feel the flow of it. Um, I, have, I think over the years incorporated some of Abraham Hicks concepts just in my daily way of talking with people. 
for example, is that an upstream thought or a downstream thought? Mm -hmm. Um, Just so many positive ways to determine where do you want to put your energy? It doesn't negate that negative things or difficult Mm -hmm. things are happening, but where you put your focus, that's where your energy is going to flow. Mm -hmm. Many of us are very used to putting our focus on the challenge, the negative, the defeat, and then that's where our energy stays. Yep. And that's, but that's what we get via the law of attraction. We get more struggle, more negativity, more challenge, more weight gain, more weight regain. And then they're like, I'm trying so hard. I'm trying so hard. I'm like, where's your focus? Mm -hmm. Are you focusing on the pure desire and how you want to feel and how good it's going to feel on the freedom of food and you know, feeling just that appreciation and love of your body, or are you being mean to it still and being your own, you know, inner critic and I'm not there yet. So Mm -hmm. I found that book, like, that's really when all of it clicked for me Mm -hmm. I'd kind of like dabbled in mindset for a long time. And that whole concept of every desire is actually two things, you know, it's the desire and it's the lack of the desire. Mm -hmm. And if you're focusing on the lack, you're going to be attracting more lack. And I'm like, well, there you have it. (laughs) There you have it. That makes so much sense. And so I know for some people, um, for some of my members, I'm like, read this book. And they're like, that's a way too woo woo. You know, they got through like, who's this Abraham guy? I'm like, I get it. I respect that. (laughs) So I am enough by Marissa Peer was kind of like my Uh second, a little bit less woo woo mindset book. Um, right now I'm reading the, the abundance book by John Randolph price, which is more about like wealth, I guess, and prosperity, but literally any book about that, you can just replace with health. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the frame that I'm reading that through. And then think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill, a really nice book. Again, just replace anything about money with health. Mm -hmm. What are some of your favorite books that you've read on the topic of mindset? Well, the one that I referred to a couple of times that I wouldn't say is woo woo, but, um, Carol Dweck's book. Yep growth mindset, I think was the beginning for me of wanting to focus more on mindset. I then moved into uh, an author named Derek Rydell. I haven't heard of him. He has one book called The Abundance Project. And I'm trying to remember the one before that. I almost Um, bought that book. I really liked him and um, his own personal journey. And um I think he does a nice job of bridging different spiritual beliefs. And, you know, it's, it's not a religious thing that he's talking Mm -hmm. about, but he brings in various beliefs to make everything kind of fit nicely together. Wayne Dyer is another big one for me. Um, Even though um, he is no longer with us, I still listen to all of his stuff on a regular basis. Um, And it's definitely Abraham Hicks. Once I found Abraham Hicks, started listening to the books, listening. I, I, on YouTube, listened to, you know, maybe five Abraham Hicks things in a row. Um, Marissa Peer has been a big one for me Mm -hmm. for the past few years. Trying to think of who else I listened to outside of those. Um, As I mentioned earlier, Joe Dispenza. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about Joe Dispenza, if anyone hasn't Um, heard of him or connected with him before he does such a great job of tying together science so science principles with this more esoteric kind of Mm -hmm. way of understanding how the world works you know a little more into kind of quantum physics and it just it's kind of mind-blowing to me And it helps me sometimes to hear a little bit of a science background because I can get a little skeptical when it gets a little too woo, even for Mm -hmm. me. And so someone that can bring back in, you know, he looks at um, health biomarkers with people while they're engaging in meditation and things. Well, if you can see health markers improve based on meditation, it's not just some woo woo thing that people have been doing for thousands Mm -hmm. of years. There's science that shows it changes you. Mm-hmm. So I love his work. And, and there are others in his um, kind of uh, work realm. or his realm. Thank you. Um, so I would say those are the big ones for me right now. I'm probably skipping over someone, but those are the big ones. 
That's okay. And then one last question before we wrap it up, what is, what are you working on right now? You know, what, what's kind of your primary focus with your own, you know, spiritual journey, um, mental health journey, personal development, what are you working on? Well, I would say the biggest right now is imposter syndrome. Really? Okay. Yeah. I, um, I tend to downplay that I have anything to add to this whole realm of, Uh of focus. And, um, when I get positive feedback, it's still hard for me to hear. I still, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. So that is definitely something that I've been working on and continue to work on. Definitely the self-sabotage. Yeah. And I think in some ways thinking of, um, I think this is true for most people. I can be very successful in certain areas of my life and other areas. I don't have that same momentum. I don't have those Mm -hmm. same patterns. Um, And so like trying to understand that, why do I get in my own way when it comes to these behaviors, when I can be so facilitative of these other behaviors? So really trying to understand that more. Um, And then I guess, you know, it still maybe goes back a little bit to the, um, the imposter syndrome, but risking putting myself out there and trusting myself and knowing that there's an audience for everything. I don't have to be the perfect, you know, answer, savior, anything for Mm -hmm. anyone necessarily, but that what I do, what I have to author, offer, excuse me, is of value to someone. And that that's all that's required is just keep, it's an exchange system in this world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I need to put myself out there and then I need to be open to receiving as well. And it sometimes is easy for me. I'm pretty introverted. And so it's easy for me just to kind of go inward, stay kind of stuck in my own stuff instead of get out there, share, receive, you know, influence, Mm -hmm. receive influence. Um, So I would say those are my, some of my growth edges right now that I'm working on. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. I can tell you're just such a gentle spirit, you know, and you've done a lot of personal growth work. And um, I think I'm like, I want to be a client of hers. (laughs) Uh, so can you tell people where they can learn about you, where they can sure. connect with you? Sure. You can go to our website at thefastingmethod.com. And I am currently coaching. And so if you're interested in seeing what we do, we do discovery calls where you can first set up a meeting and just meet with us to see if this is something you're interested in. Another thing you can do is join our community. We have a membership community. And I host three meetings a week in the community. They're large zoom meetings. So you get a sense of working with me and everything through that. Um, You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram. It's just um, Terry Lance PhD. And I would love to, you know, get feedback from people and get support from people and ideas. And also you can follow on Monday mindset podcast. That's a podcast that I do with my friend. And it's really just kind of born out of, we both liked sharing things with each other. Like, Oh, I read this great book, or I listened to this great podcast. And so that's what we do. We just share things that we think could be helpful to people and try to do it in kind of a bite-sized way. Right. Yeah. Well, this has been a, a big blessing for me today. Um, I just really appreciate the energy that you brought. I feel like you were such a calm, soothing presence throughout this whole interview. And I hope that people listening or watching just got some awesome value and great tips. You know, I think that you gave us some really practical things. My two favorite were the yet. And then, um, you know, I'm aware that I'm having a thought that Mm -hmm. I think that was a really powerful one too, to bring some space and separation between those automatic negative thoughts. So Terry, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.
Well, thank you for again having me here. And I feel the same about the interview. You make someone so comfortable to be here. I'm like, dang, I could just hang out all day. So, I know. I'm like, I wish this you. was in person. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go for some coffee or something. I know. Or to an Abraham Hicks conference together. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right.